It's good, good to be together tonight. And um, I get uh, the chance to, uh, to share with you from a familiar passage, uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and you heard uh, Becca read it for us earlier. And this, this might be uh, one of the shortest passages I've, I've ever preached from. If you are here with us on a regular basis, you, you know that, that we tend to uh, look at chapters and several chapters at a time. Uh, but as, as our passage opens tonight, uh, we heard something. Began with uh, a man named Caesar Augustus emperor of the whole known world. And then it moved to Quirinius, uh, governor over the expansive region of Syria. And then we get a child, unnamed in these seven verses, born while his parents are carrying out, are submitting to uh, royal decrees of the empire. No place for them in the guest room wrapped in the cloth available, laid to rest in a feeding trough. Caesar, Quirinius, and the baby. One of these things is not like the others. I love the Christmas story. And, and you may not know that. Uh, you may not have ever heard me say that like explicitly. Uh, and in fact, some of you have known me for, for many years uh, and so may not actually believe me when I say that I love the Christmas story. Uh, I was just telling somebody the other day that uh, back in like 2008, 2009, uh, when I was the youth pastor, uh, I had this strange thing happen to me, which was every time I preached that year, somehow it just so happened I preached on all of the major holidays. And, uh, and so I developed a bit of a reputation so that whether it was Christmas or not, uh, I was getting called uh, Ebenezer and the Grinch uh, a fair amount. And as you, you know me, uh, I am no real fan of, of what I might call uh, our cultural Christmas, uh, while at the same time uh, loving deeply the story of Christmas, the story that has this ability to, to stir in me and captivate uh, me year after year. So that uh, as, as much as you might feel, ah, man, we hear that story all the time, I just am drawn to it. Uh, and if I'm honest, uh, this tension is tough to figure out. Uh, and You've probably heard me say something along the lines of, uh, when I look at the cultural, Christianity, or cultural Christmas that sort of surrounds us, that my temptation is uh, to just opt out of it entirely. And so sometimes for me, honestly, it feels like the only way forward in the midst of this cultural Christmas that's so present and so loud and so distracting all the time, like my, my instinct is to just be anti-Christmas, right? I mean, we know that in the scriptures, like we're never commanded to celebrate Christmas. So, so why not just cling to Christ and let the culture have its Christmas and whatever they want to do with it? This tends to be my, my way. To see something that looks really broken, broken beyond repair and go, ah, I can't do anything with this and throw it away. Uh, or to see something that looks like irredeemable and to just give up on it, count, it, count our losses, start over, to quit in the face of the impossible. And so this is why I desperately need the story of Christmas year after year, because I, I need to be reminded that God is not a quitter. I need to fix my eyes on the one who refuses to scrap his beloved project, even when that project like, goes out of its way to scrap itself. Our God sees this world that he made, 
This world that was marred by violence, ruled by tyrants, where oppression was the order of the day, where Caesars were called gods, where empires were confused with the kingdom of God, and where, where the image of God hardwired into the people that God lovingly made is darkened, barely visible. God sees this world, and he writes his Christmas story on it. God sees the irredeemable and he then takes on their flesh. God sees his creation, the whole of it, wounded and groaning for redemption, and he comes to groan with it. God sees the people who have, have rejected him and draws near to them. And he dwells with them. God doesn't opt out because it's too messy or too hard. Messy is his business. Christmas is where God opts in. And as we come to this story and as we reflect on it, <laughs> he does it in such a weird way. All right, a way that, that makes our, our cultural Christmas seem almost a bit perverse in what it's become. Think about uh, what we've read. Our passage, it opens with this clear message about, about who is in charge in the world. Uh, things like, in those days, and it happened when Caesar and Quirinius were in charge. Time in this day is marked by, by these men, men like them. They are the ones who have built mighty empires. They are the ones steering the world. And so the solution to the world uh, is really simple, if you ask me. Uh, fix them, and you fix the world, right? Remove them, and you set the world free. This is my simple solution to the problem. And God looks at me and says, oh, isn't he adorable? Because it's so easy to forget that God has done this before. I mean, the story of the Exodus, where God confronts Pharaoh in power, demanding that Pharaoh let his people go, is all the proof we need that, that God can bring down the powerful by overpowering them. The problem with bringing down pharaohs and Caesars and kings and presidents is that the weak and the oppressed and the, and the enslaved uh, sort of quickly rise up and they just become new pharaohs and Caesars corrupted with their new power. This is the story of Israel. This is the story of the nations in the world. This is the story scripture tells us. This is the story we, we see play out as we look through history. Crowns change hands, but, but the world stays the same. God seems to understand this. And so he does something very different. While we are busy, while we get busy trying to fix the thing, God gets busy serving it. Well, while nobody is looking, he sneaks in the back door. And he apparently isn't in a rush because he comes as a baby who like, can't do anything for a significant period of time. And he, and he shows up uh, quietly through mostly insignificant people in a mostly insignificant region of the world. And there's no parade and there's no party. And the truth is there's not even a place for him. I don't, I don't know what you think when you read that line. There was no place for him. Uh, in the inn. I don't know what you picture. Um, it's, it's been popular to imagine Mary and Joseph, you know, coming into this crowded town and being turned away because there aren't enough rooms. There's like no vacancy uh, in this town. Uh, but there are, there are biblical scholars who suggest that there's a better way of understanding what's going on. Later in Luke's gospel, there's a different word used for an inn that you might think of where you go and you rent a room for a night. But the word here in Luke 2, uh, verse 7, also refers to a, a guest room of sorts uh, that would have been common uh, during this time. So, a guest room. Well, 
if we're talking about a guest room in a home and we combine that with the value placed on hospitality in that society, and then we add to that the likelihood that here in the city of David where Joseph has ancestors, that, that there's a family that they're related to that they could have and should have stayed with, you, you get a different picture of what might be happening here. I mean, in the ancient world, it was a grave sin to, to not extend hospitality to somebody. You honored someone, even if they were a complete stranger. I mean, like, could you imagine? Somebody shows up at your door and goes, hey, I need a place to stay tonight. I'm just traveling through town. You go, sorry, there's a place down the street. But that, that was unheard of. Even a stranger passing through town, you gave them a place in your home. You gave them your guest room. But there's this question uh, when we get to family, and especially certain kinds of family. Like, what do you do with the young couple in your family who are about to have a baby outside of marriage in a culture where that was virtually unheard of? It was a badge of shame. Do you believe their story that, you know, God miraculously gave Mary a baby with no help from Joseph, that Mary and Joseph are both on the up and up? Do you honor them in your home? Do you give them a place? Or do you view them as people of shame? And does their shame require a place that is a bit lower, a place that better reflects their, their shameful situation? Perhaps you give them a place with the animals, a place with the feeding trough where the baby can rest. This is a weird way for God to enter the world. But not only does God opt into the messiness, but he opts in at the ground level and he, he gets himself covered in the shame and all of it. And where we look at the world that Jesus came into and, and we see the great and the powerful and the oppressive tyrant Caesar and, and we want to see him dishonored, God takes upon himself ah, a place of dishonor. A few minutes ago, I suggested that in light of this story, our, our cultural Christmas, the, the way that we view the, the Christmas that happens throughout our culture uh, changes a bit in our minds. That it, it's, it's more than just unfortunate that it's so disconnected from, from who Jesus is and the light and the life that he is. And it's, it's not that it's just distracting, but I suggested earlier a few minutes ago that, it, that it's actually quite perverse. And, and what I mean by that is, is this beautiful, mind-renewing, heart-turning moment when, when the God of the universe humbly enters our world as a baby, that this good news has been so twisted that, that it, it really bears the image of another God altogether. So that our best marketers and capitalists have, have taken Christmas for us through the decades and they have sold it back to us. Um, an enhanced version, a, a version on steroids, a, a version in the image of Caesar. And we've been willing to pay for it. Think about who Caesar was. Caesar was huge throughout the world that he ruled. He and his image were seen everywhere. Roads and columns and statues were built throughout the empire for him. Everything about Caesar was big. And there were parties and celebrations that were held in his honor. And, his, and, and he made promises, great sweeping promises throughout his kingdom. And the call was trust Caesar with the with the peace that he brings, that he offers you. Trust Caesar and his sword to protect you. Trust Caesar with your lives and your loyalty and your allegiance. In the meantime, 
while Caesar is busy doing all this stuff, Jesus is born in a place of shame. He's born in obscurity. He's born in a position to do nothing except show us how far God is willing to go to be with his people, to show us a better way, to be human, to be who God made us to be. As huge as, as Caesar was in the ancient world, our cultural Christmas is in many ways bigger and more influential and more pervasive. Right? I mean, if, if the world marked time according to Caesar, in the days of Caesar, I mean, how much more does everything we do uh, move according to our cultural Christmas when the stores open and start announcing that it's Christmas time and you should start buying? We, oh, okay, it's time to, to show up. And then everything shuts on Christmas. And then, right, and you could keep going through the list in terms of the ways that, that it orients our time. And if Caesar could compel his citizens to travel unreasonable distances while pregnant, how much more does Christmas compel this sort of travel? Music is piping through the speakers in every store. Everything is covered in, in colors and lights. There are events and there are parties and there are festivals and there are parades. And just as all of the pomp and the circumstance surrounding the, the great and the powerful Caesar kept people focused on, on him and on power and on the kingdom, the empire, and they, and they missed the birth of an unnamed baby in a corner of the empire called Bethlehem. So too, have you noticed this, that, that our cultural Christmas tends to keep people from noticing the humble king who is still at work in our lives and in our world, often in places of obscurity. I wanna, I wanna end with an example with kind of an illustration. And I'm not one for like physical props usually, so this might fail epically. Um, but you, you hopefully will, will kind of get the idea uh, behind what we're, what we're doing here. Um, I hope none of you are afraid of the dark. So, Teresa, we turn those lights out to your right, those ones right there. Yeah. Okay, nobody scared? We're all good here? If you need to hold somebody's hand next to you, do that. I forgot that I can't see my paper when the lights go out. That's awkward. <laughs> Details. Um, can everybody see the Christ candle? The Christ candle is a symbol. It reminds us of the light of Jesus born into the darkness of this world. This is what God intended. Uh, I was in here earlier today practicing this and I had forgot to turn on the, uh, the other the Christmas tree lights. It was way darker. Um, so again, use your imaginations with me. But this Christ candle is simple and it's humble and it's beautiful and it's actually surprisingly bright. When I was in here this afternoon with, without a light on and it was just that, I mean, I, I was shocked at how bright it was in the midst of the darkness. But if, if we're honest, you look at that, that small flame and it doesn't really phase the darkness. The darkness is still here, it's still dark in here. The light of Christ does not overthrow Caesar or Rome. The Caesar who is marking time when Jesus is born isn't overthrown because the light suddenly shows up. And, and so it's interesting as we look at Caesar and Rome, as we look at the darkness of our world, we get this sort of brilliant idea. We love to help God out. And so we decide we're going to fix the darkness for God. And so we, we help out. We, 
We, we try to enhance and magnify the birth of Jesus, the light of Christ, with all sorts of artificial light, all sorts of things that, that make it look bigger than it is. We blow it up so that it can take on the darkness because by itself, that little light just doesn't really seem to do all that much. But, but if, you, if you think about it, if you notice what happens, the power of the artificial light in many ways is, is more powerful than the darkness. It's worse than the darkness in this room. It, in the darkness, and you're gonna have to take my word for it here, uh, when everything was dark and it was just that single candle lit, the light of Jesus was crisp and it was clear. The contrast between the darkness, where the darkness stopped and where Christ's light began could be seen powerfully. But, but if you look at what happens when you begin to add lights to it, when you begin to shine other sorts of lights on it and try to make it bigger, the artificial light, it pretends to magnify the light of Jesus when all it does is wash it out. The more lights you add, the less you're able to see the flame that's there. The more the flame disappears into all of the other stuff that's happening around it the less you can distinguish between the light of Christ and the darkness that surrounds it. It's darkness that knowing it cannot put out the light instead decides to masquerade as light in order to wash out the true light. One of the challenges we face is that there will often be things that look really good that look a lot like the light and the life that Jesus offer us, but actually blur or cover or wash out the beauty of who Christ is and what he has done. So that the more artificial lights we turn on, the more fanfare, the dimmer, the humble light of Christ becomes. And I think, I think we sense that I, I have heard that from many of you as we've talked about what it looks like to walk faithfully as followers of Jesus through this season of sort of madness since, when is it now, like right after Halloween, <laughs> that Christmas stuff starts to come out. But Christmas tells a better story, a story of a better way, a light that gives life, a light that is true a light that shines brightly, a light that's passed on to men and women. And this is the key for us tonight, is that the light of Christ was never supposed to stay in Bethlehem by itself. The light of Christ was supposed to be passed on, not with torches and spotlights, but the same light that Christ bore we bear. And so uh, you came in with, with candles. Uh, and tonight we will we'll end just singing a song of great joy, but also reflecting on what it means to bear the light of Christ as we walk through Christmas, as we live with gratitude for what God has given us.